The viewpoints expressed on Night Fright are not necessarily those of the host, the staff, the sponsors, or the affiliate stations. Tonight's program may contain graphic themes or images. Viewer discretion is advised. There is a time for question. There is a time for answers. There is a time for challenge. There is a time to speculate. There is a time for change. There is a time for truth. The time is now. Showtime! Welcome to the show, everybody. I'm Brent Holland, and welcome, one and all, to Night Fright. That's a horrible night out there outside the studio. Um, the snow's coming down, it's mixed with sleet, it's rainy, it's a very, very good night. To not be traveling and to stay inside, get in your most comfy chair, get the coffee going, get the tea going, or a beverage of your choice. Got a great ride for you, but first, I want to talk about what happened today in Brussels. It was a horrible day today in Brussels. The terrorists may seem to have won today. They may win the odd little battle, folks, but they are not going to win the war. The outcome of this war has already been written, and it doesn't end well for them, let me tell you. I want to extend everyone here at the show sympathy and solidarity with those who have suffered loss today. Always remember, always remember, folks, that we're with you. Uh, nous sommes en solidarité avec vous toujours, tout le temps, pour all times, for all times. Jamais, 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 never will they win, folks. Absolument, n'est pas possible. Uh, nous sommes uh, strong, we're unafraid, and um, we're just going to keep going. So, ISIS, if you're listening, and I hope you are, because you need to be educated to this, because it is not going to end well for you. Good luck to you. It's just not going to happen. But Brussels, no, we're with you. We have your backs, without question. The show tonight, folks. I hope you're in your comfy chair. I hope you've got that beverage of choice going, or a coffee or a tea. We're going to be looking straight at the Secret Service and um, the Kennedy assassination in particular with one of the leading experts on the subject, author, researcher Vince Palamara returns with his new book. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> JFK from Parkland to Bethesda, the yep. ultimate Kennedy assassination compendium. We're also going to be looking at some excerpts from his other book, which is called Survivor's Guilt, The Secret Service and the Failure to Protect President Kennedy, but primarily from his new book. Just want to let you know that the two of them are available at www.nightfrightshow.com. Click on tonight's guest book covers, and you'll be able to order them from the comfort of your own home. So Vince Palomara is the leading civilian expert on the United States Secret Service, having interviewed agents that were on Kennedy's protective detail November 22nd, 1963, of course, the day Kennedy was assassinated. Vince Palomara has appeared on the History Channel, Bravo, buddy. C-SPAN, way to go. And, mm -hmm. of course, Night Fright. Tonight yeah. we'll be looking... <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Tonight we're going to be looking... A little joke there. Tonight <laughs> we're going to be looking at if the Secret Service was complicit in the Kennedy assassination. We're going to be looking at why some of the agents assigned to protect President Kennedy, November 22, 1963, felt it was okay to stay out all night and be drunk on duty which means that they were drunk on duty the very next morning. They were still hungover. We'll be looking at Secret Service agents. Very few know this story, but it's right in here, folks, in this book, testifying they believed a shot originated from guess where? From in front of JFK. 
which means, of course, two shooters, one behind JFK, the other in front, which means, by definition, conspiracy. Now, why the heck is this always glossed over by mainstream media? We'll be looking at the reasons for that, too. We're going to be looking at the Secret Service cover-up of the assassination and the consequential setup of a whistleblower by the name of Abraham Bolden, who was the first African-American Secret Service agent on White House protective duty. But get this, he was handpicked by JFK. He was not on duty November 22nd, and he was set up for a crime he did not commit. We'll be looking at that for sure. And as Mr. Bolden has told me, he would have taken that fatal shot and sacrificed his own life for JFK. We're also going to go a little bit different, and this is in the book also, folks. We also delve into the real testimony of Jackie Kennedy about what she witnessed and experienced trying hopelessly, hopelessly, this is the insanity of the moment, to keep her husband's head intact while he lay in her lap on the harrowing drive from Dealey Plaza to Parkland. It's my great pleasure to welcome back to Night Fright, Vince Palomara. How you doing, buddy? It's good to see you. Oh, great. Hey, nice to see you, Brent, and welcome to you and to all your listeners. Great Thank to be back. Thank you so much, my friend. Okay, let's let's jump in right away, shall we? Sure, it sounds great. Yeah. What I noticed in your book, um, going through all the testimony, and folks, it truly is uh, the ultimate Kennedy assassination compendium. Uh, a lot of the witnesses that have put testimony down said they heard a firecracker as their first shot. Any speculation as to why they all thought it was a firecracker? Yeah, and yeah, and even disturbing enough is the fact that trained ears, Secret Service agents, a lot of them also yeah. said it was a firecracker. Um, I'm in agreement with a few other researchers on this. I think that's because the first round was a short round and perhaps that was the one that either missed or the one that went to kennedy's back and didn't exit never went through the throat there's no single bullet theory we'll get into that if you want but yeah i think the reason why there was a difference in the sound the tonality the first one did sound like a firecracker because it was a short round mm. and then the next two were unmistakably gunshots it's not even a question of they were caught by surprise there's a little bit of element of that but the tonality of it i think definitely it's not like it was a short round yeah and do you think that was a good enough reason for the Secret Service to stay stationary on the follow-up car? Absolutely not. Yeah, no, definitely not. Yeah. yeah, I mean, the bottom line is here, that's what they were, you know, paid to do. I mean, first and foremost, it affected the president and his family and whatnot. And uh, you just go back to um, 1933, actually late 1932, early 1933, um, when FDR was president-elect, he was in an open car, and the Secret Service protected him then. Robert Clark, an agent, uh, was wounded in the hand, but uh, you know, the president-elect lived. I mean, in 1950, uh, several agents went on to protect President Kennedy, uh, protected Harry Truman from assassination attempt. It was a conspiracy of two shooters that day, November 1st, 1950. But the bottom line is, to answer your question directly, is that whenever a shot or shots rings out, they're there to cover and evacuate. They're not there to try to, you know, investigate the crime. They're not even there secondary as to shoot back or anything like that. Their number one thing is to cover and evacuate. Yeah. Very, very, very good point. Um, and, you know, Mr. Bolden told me the same thing, of course. He said, even if, the, if they ended up looking foolish, JFK was such a personality, he didn't care. He cooperated in every sense of the word cooperation with the Secret Service. Right. And I want to get into the, um, the false orders that were given uh, for the Secret Service to vacate that car that day and leave him all alone. But I just want to set it up, folks, the fact that uh, Mr. Kennedy was always cooperating with the Secret Service. So as Mr. Bolden said, and as Vince just said, even if they were mistaken, as soon as they heard some, an anomaly, as such as a firecracker or, or anything else, they should have been surrounding the president right away. That's oh, and what they thing were trained too, to do. Yeah, and Brent, you know, another thing too is in 1960 when Kennedy, it was President-elect Kennedy, Richard Pavlik, a disturbed man, um, had dynamite in his car and was going to blow him up. And it was only because he saw Jacqueline and Caroline and he melted and said, I just couldn't do it. I couldn't kill Mrs. Kennedy and the child. But so he was already facing the assassination attempt. He already had the last rights administered, you know, three times. 
And then, you know, the Secret Service was much aware of other threats. President Kennedy had, like, his favorite poem was The Rendezvous of Death, and he was much aware of other threats because he would even jokingly banter when he went to church one time. He turned to the Secret Service agent and said, hey, if uh, there's somebody up in that church choir, when are you boys going to help me out there? So, I mean, definitely was on his mind. So, you know, they were all much aware of not only just the common sense of that's what their job was, but... Definitely. That, that's my thing. It's not even Monday morning quarterback. And Kennedy should have lived, whether there was a conspiracy or it was Oswald Act alone, which I don't believe. But even if somebody out there thinks that, Kennedy should have lived. And we can get into the details of why that's, why I'm making that claim. But there's no doubt about it. You know? Well, let's go there right now. Why should okay. he have lived? All right. Well, here's a story on that. Um, and this, uh, this is going to be brought up more. In fact, I got a third book coming out here later this year, or early next year. Uh, yeah, The Not So Secret Service. Agency tales from FDR to the Kennedy assassinations of the Reagan era, and even though obviously by the title you can tell it's FDR to Reagan, there's still three, three or four prominent chapters on the Kennedy assassination. It's loose ends, uh, things that were covered. You know, I wouldn't say they were glossed over in the first book because they weren't, but much more detail and some new evidence that came out ever since 2013, and whatnot. And to answer you directly on this is a big discovery of mine, and again it's brought up more in the third book is that building rooftops were normally guarded. Multi-story building rooftops were guarded from FDR, Truman, Eisenhower, and the Kennedy era. Not just as a response to the Kennedy assassination afterwards, but they were guarded before that. And what I mean by that was not the single, um, you know, like ranch-style homes. Those were just left alone because the police or military or secret service were guarding them from street levels. That was fine. But any kind of multi-story buildings or, or um, city limits what they would do is they would station, usually the sheriff's department would guard the rooftops. And when the procession would pass, then they would be relieved if everything was okay. And then the next officer would be on the next building and so on and so forth. Find a few photos where you actually see on the perimeter um, a few uh, officers and, and military and whatnot. But more importantly, I find contemporary newspaper articles going back to FDR, through Truman, through Eisenhower, and through Kennedy, I found a whole bunch of newspaper articles nonchalantly saying to the, the, the captain of the police, saying, yeah, we have to guard the tops of the buildings for the motorcade. It's like, whoa, this is unbelievable. And again, this is all this came out uh, happenstance. Uh, in fact, how, well, the genesis of this was, um, there was a book that came out in 1962, the year before the Kennedy assassination. It was meant for young adults, long out of print, by Wayne Hyde. It's called, What Does a Secret Service Agent Do? Mm -hmm. I got it. I got the book back in like uh, 2003. It's like I said, it's long out of print. And to my shock and surprise, um, early in the book it says, "Whenever the president appears in an outdoor motorcade, uh, building rooftops are guarded by agents and police." And I turn to the beginning of the book again, and it was done with the cooperation of Chief James Riley and uh, Michael Trina, the Chief Inspector of the Secret Service. Michael Trina wrote the Secret Service Manual in the 1950s. If anybody knows the proper procedure. He will. I corresponded with the gentleman twice, and he confirmed the veracity of the book, of the statement in the book. I mean, he went and put out a book with a pack of lies. This is with the cooperation of the Secret Service. But when he said that, I was like, wow, this is unbelievable. He's not just talking about inaugural. He's not talking about just Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. He's talking about outdoor motorcades. So what I did, what I, what I wanted to do, is that in and of itself is pretty powerful because it's coming from the chief inspector of the Secret Service who wrote the Secret Service manual. But still, I was in the quest for more, because I, I more evidence, because I know how people work. They play devil's advocate, and sometimes good, sometimes bad, and they're you know looking, yeah, that's good, Vince, but I need more than that. So that's what I did. I trudged archives. So as you uh, go into these archives, we had to pay <laughs> for articles and whatnot, and just dredge, and sometimes it was dead end. But I, again, lo and behold, I found these articles where they're saying that, you know, whenever the president, this is President Kennedy in particular, when uh, he visited Nashville, Tennessee, police were on the rooftops. When he visited Paris, police were on the rooftops. $64 million question is, even if you're skeptical and believe Oswald Act alone, very small percentage, mm -hmm. okay, can you have your Oswald Act alone? If the police would have been on the rooftops guarding, uh, the assassination would have been aborted, would have been pre prevented, and JFK would have lived right there. And uh, I go into so much more, and it's like I said, picture says a thousand words, and I think people are really going to be, I mean, it's definitely covered in the first book to a point, mm -hmm. but the new book coming out, uh, The Not So Secret Service, will definitely go into that in more detail. But uh, yes, survivor's guilt. And uh, yeah. the other major um, discovery of mine was not always, but usually agents rode on or near the rear of the car, the, the handrails in the back of the car. 
and uh, anybody sees the Zabruder film, when the shooting's all over and done with, Clint Hill belatedly comes to the president's aide and Jacqueline Kennedy's aide. He was a Jacqueline Kennedy agent. He was a special agent in charge of the first lady detail. He gets the back of the car and notices that he has those handrails. Well, there's a reason why those handrails were in the back of the limousine, ladies and gentlemen, and it was there because it was a pr- protection for the, uh, the Secret Service to be able to get up there. In fact, if you see like old newsreels of the FDR, Truman, and Eisenhower days, they often rode on the uh, big running boards of the car. Well, this was the Lincoln Continental. So what they did is they had these handholds. And uh, a fair amount of uh, motorcades that I have where the Secret Service are either walking, jogging, running beside the car, or they're riding on these um, rear platforms. In fact, in Tampa, Florida, four days before Dallas, Chuck Zaboro and Don Lawton, two agents, were riding on the back of the car. And here's the thing. This was the longest motorcade domestically JFK ever uh, undertook. It was 28 miles long. Far longer than Dallas. Oh, it was like five times longer than Dallas. And yet he gets to Dallas. There's no agents on the back of the car other than Clint Hill briefly on Main Street, just on protecting Jacqueline's side. No one ever goes near Kennedy's side. And building rooftops were guarded in Tampa. Again, the longest motorcade ever, 28 miles. They had the manpower and the wherewithal to do that. And yet they get to Dallas and building rooftops are guarded. And to his credit, Larry Sabato... A lot of times people see him on CNN. He's a political commentator. Came out with a book called The Kennedy Half Century. And in it, he takes Gerald Blaine to task. And I think it's based on my blog a little bit because he quotes my blog. And he asked Mr. Blaine of the Kennedy detail fame, the book that came out. And we'll get into that in a second. And Mr. Blaine says, well, uh, we didn't have the manpower in Dallas. (laughs) I'm part of building rooftops. I'm thinking, Larry didn't fall up. You didn't have the manpower, but you had the manpower in a far longer motorcade. And yet a much shorter motorcade, you have the manpower, and people just believe that. See, what it is is they realize now they're they're caught out to dry. It was little old me, a little old amateur me out of the woodwork, you know, and basically in the millennium when it came out with the Internet, and some of these foreign rages started to see what I was coming up with. And uh, in the interest of time, I'll just let you know that, you know, for better or for worse, my 22-page letter to Clint Hill was the genesis of the Kennedy Detail book and all the subsequent follow-ups by default because that was the first book they came out with and they tried to put the blame back on Kennedy. But the thing is, if agents would have been beside the car, it would have blocked a shot from the rear, Oswald or whatnot. It would also have blocked a shot from the front because those men would have been over there to cover and evacuate Kennedy. If the building rooftops would have been guarded, again, if you believe Oswald act alone, they would have been able to cover that window or they would have been obviously guard against a multiple shooter conspiracy. Uh, normally the cars went much faster than they did in Dallas. It, it slowed to the like 11.2 miles an hour, which is like basically the speed of pulling out of a parking space. Uh, usually there was a lot more motorcycles around the car, and a lot of these changes were made on the 11th hour. All of a sudden he goes from having four motorcycles, uh, well four on each side, down to two, and it had in- insult to injury. They bring the two motorcycle officers beside uh, behind the limousine, which puts them totally out of the picture. So they were useless. They were just there window dressing. Whereas in Houston, Fort Worth, and San Antonio the day before, in that morning in Fort Worth, motorcycles are surrounding the car like normal. And I have plenty of newsreels and whatnot on uh, trips to Germany, Ireland, Italy, uh, all the you know, domestic trips. Motorcycles are surrounding the car. It was a normal thing. And that's why I like to tell people that uh, this isn't through um, rose colored glasses. You no, know, no, not at all. It's definitely. Yeah, you would say some, Brent? Yes. Yeah, I was going to yes. ask you, Vince, whose responsibility was it to pull those agents off? There's a very famous clip on YouTube you can find, folks. Just Google yeah. in Kennedy um, Detail, something along those lines, and um, Love Field. There's a very famous clip where you see the Secret Service agent getting ready to grab those handrails, just as you described at the back, yes. on the uh, on the passenger side in the rear. And he's called back to the follow-up Secret Service car. Any idea who made that call? Yes, I do. And you're looking at the person who discovered that video. And when I say discovered, let me just clarify. I didn't film it, okay? And it was technically out there already, but I popularized it, let's put it that way. From 1964, when people started to notice, that came out obviously November 22nd, 1963. It was WFA, the ABC affiliate in Dallas, Dallas Fort Worth did this black and white video of the beginning of the motorcade leaving Love Field the Dallas airport. And what you're referring to is two agents, Henry Ribka, uh, R-Y-B-K-A, and Don Lawton. They were walking, sort of walking, jogging beside Kennedy's limousine. 
But then it switches from the newsreels to the black and white video, and all you see is Don Lawton at this point. Emery Roberts, the commander of the FOB car, rises in the seat and with hand gestures, goes like this, goes, what gives? You know, like, and Don Lawton raises his hand three times in disgust, basically saying, what gives? And he stays there, and Paul Landis makes room for him on the FOB car by getting into the car to leave room for him on the running board. Don Lawton doesn't budge. I have more information on this in my new book. And Don Lawton uh, said, I should have been there. He talked to, um, there was a lady friend of his who was in, in, uh, in military intelligence. And she said later on that Don Lawton had many regrets. He, and one of the things he kept on saying, I should have been there. I should have been on the back of the car. So obviously he felt remorse about this. Now, I did not know. Here's the interesting thing. And I spoke to Don Lawton in 1995, but I did not know at the time that he was the agent in question in the video. So unfortunately, a golden opportunity was gone as far as that goes. Now, the good news is he agreed with Sam Kinney and Bob Lilly, two fellow agents, that uh, President Kennedy did not order them off the car. And he said, oh, you always have remorse, regrets. Who knows? If they would have left agents in the back of the car, you could hindsight yourself to death on this. But the, the important thing of that is he didn't say, President Kennedy orders off the car. Oh, there's nothing to this. He actually talked about the remorse of not being there to me. And then this lady came out in 2013 because Don Lawton passed away early 2013. So this lady came out. It was a very um, obscure article, I think, in Idaho, if I'm not mistaken. And it was a little local newspaper. And it was not uh, picked up by the AP or anybody else. And this lady, as a matter of fact, I just talked about her friendship with him. And for years, he always had this regret. But to your point about this, yeah, 1991... I discovered this in the raw footage of WFAA, and it's it's on Four Days in November, which is a David Wolper production from 1964, a couple other uh, productions, but I started presenting this video in the 90s at major conferences like Copa and JFK Lancer, and people were blown away. Said, Vince, I've never seen it before. What is this? This is incredible. I showed it in 2003 on the History Channel of the Men Who Killed Kennedy, which had uh, huge ratings and was on DVD and VHS. It wasn't until 2000, late 2005, early 2006, it hit YouTube, and they used a poor quality copy but the point being is it was little old me out in the wilderness in 1991 that popularized this and again the picture says a thousand words you can see by the body language i mean you, know, you can speak yeah. a poor language he was and you see the body language of this agent who happens to be don lawton and before him was henry ribka henry ribka was an agent who was jogging beside the cars which created a little confusion early on from some people didn't know who the agent was because actually he was relieved by Henry Ripko was relieved by Don Lawton, who's the agent we see who raises his hands up. Henry Roberts is the big suspect of mine, one of three, because he was the commander of the agents of the fall car. He ordered the two men not to move, you know, when, when the motorcade began. Well, nobody ever went to JFK side during the entire motorcade, and then when the shooting begins, get this now, he orders the men not to move. Hold that thought for a second, I'll get to that. Jack Reddy takes a few forward steps, That's he orders right. him back. I think he was responsible for Clint Hill's late reaction as well. And Clint Hill actually gets there belatedly. People make him out to be a hero, but I'll just say he got there later than people realize. It wasn't a split second too late. He was there after it was all over and done with, and then he gets in the back of the car, no matter how heroic we try to make it out to be. But getting back to Emory Roberts, uh, yeah, what, what happened was um, Harrison Livingstone in High Treason made a comment that just shook me up. He said that Emory Roberts ordered the agents not to move, and there was no source on this statement. So I read it to Sam Kinney, Sam Kinney being the driver of the fob car, Sam Kinney being the agent who's one foot away from Emory Roberts, so he was in the fob car, he heard everything, saw everything. And so I said, is this true? Did Emory Roberts order the men off, you know, not to move? He says, exactly right. And I couldn't believe my ears, exactly right. And he told me before I could collect my thoughts, is, yeah, well, you know, we, uh, didn't, you know, I was afraid of running over the guys. You know, I didn't know what to do, so I swerved the Isn't car. Is that what he said? Yeah. See, the thing is, it's amazing. Yeah, I know. And the thing about this is, yeah, you know, your thought is, these are Secret Service agents. Like, I talked to Dan Abbott, who's an author of a book, Within Arms, like a, a Secret Service agent himself. He said, that is ridiculous. You're there to cover and evacuate. Your personal safety is way down the totem pole to protect the president. Shot or shots ring out. You're supposed to leap forward, and Jack Reddy is like a statue with uh, rubber cement on his feet, never moves to the car, but he, when he makes a few forward steps, that's when every robber says, no, 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 stay back. And in the Alkins photo, the famous photo of um, people mistakenly thought I was Oswald in the doorway. But you can see Emery Roberts with a radio microphone to his hand when JFK is receiving the first shot. Emery Roberts is at the radio microphone. Presumably that's when he's radioing about they're heading to the trademark. But what doesn't make sense about that official story is 
that's during the shooting. How can he be saying we're going to the trademark? He had to realize what's going on. And before you catch your breath on that radio transmission, when they come out of the underpass, there's another, it's the Mel McIntyre photo, and he had the radio microphone to his mouth again. So we're left to ponder what these radio transmissions were. But Emory Roberts, no doubt about him, he, if he would have acted, first of all, these, these gentlemen, these agents should have used a little more common sense. Nine of them were out drinking the night before, so I definitely think sleep deprivation and alcohol had something to do with it. But beyond that, if we can somehow give them the benefit of the doubt for the sleep deprivation and alcohol consumption, which was a no-no, to put a molly. Emory Roberts was the commander of that fob car. He was the head coach, so to speak, of the team. And when he ordered them not to move, they were perplexed. In those critical seconds, look at the Reagan assassination yeah, video, right. assassination attempt. The only thing they had was agile minds and fleetness of foot. Unbelievable what they did. Tim, Mac, Tim McCarthy, uh, you know, he took the bullet. Jerry Parr, who I spoke to, a great guy, he passed away recently. He pushed Reagan into the limousine. Beautiful, in like less than six seconds. And here, the Kennedy assassination, depending on who you believe, took about six to eight seconds, hard seconds. You count that off, it doesn't seem like a lot, but one second to the Secret Service is like a lot a lot of time to you and me for their training. And there was definitely time they could have took evasive action. Bill Greer, my sec second suspect, was the driver of the presidential limousine. And the thing about him was he bears a heavy burden in the assassination. Even people like Gerald Posner and Vince Bugliosi, of all people, have always said, oh, if Bill Greer would hit the gas, Kennedy lives. And That's you right. know what? There's no doubt about it. And it's a sequence is very crucial. First shot or shots ring out, whether it's a miss or a hit, Kennedy's hit. Bill Greer turns back and is looking right at Kennedy, okay? So I always make the analogy to people. Imagine you're going 11 miles an hour, the, about the speed of pulling out of a parking spot, mm -hmm. and you're looking back and you're seeing a loved one injured from gunfire. Are you going to just sit there and do nothing? Are you Are going to hit the gas? Are you going to swerve, take some sort of evasive action? You're not even a Secret Service agent. The answer would be yes. It would just be muscle memory. You're going to do something. Well, not only does he do nothing, he faces forward again. Okay, He lied to the Warren Commission and said he never saw a sight of Kennedy. Roy Kellerman, who was the agent in charge of uh, the well, the limousine in, in the trip, even though he was a third stringer, he tells Bill Greer, get out of line, we've been hit. And then he grabs a radio microphone. Bill Greer disobeys a direct order and looks back at Kennedy a second time and is staring at Kennedy when the fatal shot makes its mark. Only then does he face forward hit the gas. See, a lot of times for years people talked about one look. It was little old me who discovered, popularized the two looks. People always thought it was just one. It's like, no, my God, it's two. It's a sequence. It's Roy Kellerman tell him to get out of the line. And buried in death of a president, although it was a bestseller, again, <laughs> little old me popularizes. No one ever knows this. It's buried in a footnote. Roy Kellerman, who was interviewed by William Manchester, tells him, yeah, Bill Greer then looked in the back of the car. Maybe he didn't believe me. I don't know if that was sarcasm or a little bit of an indictment, but the bottom line is it's very true. Even if Greer couldn't react on his own, if he had no common sense, he's getting shot in his ear, get out of line, we've been hit. Obviously, he's hearing screams from the women, too, as well as the uh, visceral mm -hmm. reaction of Governor Connolly, you know, everything going on, and yet he does what he does, and that insult to injury, he lies about to the Warren Commission. I never saw a sight of uh, President Kennedy, never saw him, and I hit the gas and it was probably the second shot. So he's trying to claim it was all before the headshot. Okay, and then when he gets, he's all full remorse that day, the Parkland Hospital. When they get to the Bethesda Naval Hospital, he's talking to the FBI agents, he tacitly blames the president for what's going on. He says, well, normally you try to keep a fast speed, but the president sometimes, you know, he sometimes ordered us to slow down. So the, so the genesis of the blame the victim movement was there that night, and it goes through the Warren Commission. The, you know, the Secret Service, five reports, blame President Kennedy for having them off the back of the car. Yet little old amateur me, starting in 1992, started to talk to these guys, and it just blew my, I couldn't believe what they were telling me. Gerald Bain, no relation to Gerald Bain of the Kennedy detail. Gerald Bain was the special agent in charge of the White House detail. The number one agent, okay? Gerald Bain, who wrote the Kennedy detail, was a buck private. Gerald Bain, B-E-H-N, he was the number one agent. He was there from 1939 to 1967, guarded FDR through LBJ, but he was a special agent in charge for JFK and part of LBJ. I spoke to him on September 27th, 1992. I always tell people that was the day, like everybody, like from David Lifton, the day that blew his mind, so to speak, or the day that really uh, just enlightened him was the day he found the Seabird, Seabird New, New Report about right, surgery right. the head area. So David me, Lifton, best evidence is his book. Best, best Sorry, evidence, yeah. That's okay, no problem. Um, September 27th, uh, 1992, I spoke to Mr. Bain, and, I, and at this time, I just would tell the audience, I begrudgingly believed some of the things I read in Jim Bishop's book, The Day Kennedy Was Shot, 
William Manchester's book, uh, The Death of a President, and even the Warren Report about Kennedy. I thought more was the Secret Service screwed up, but it was more gross negligence. But hey, some things maybe Kennedy was responsible for. This is the turnaround. This is when everything turned on its head. I just nonchalantly ran it by Mr. Bain. I said, yeah, I understand President Kennedy, uh, he sometimes ordered you guys off the back of the car. He said, I don't remember Kennedy ever ordering us off the back of the car. I couldn't believe it. I just went white as a ghost, like the hair in the back of the neck. So goes, if you look at the newsreel pictures, you'll see agents on there from time to time. And keep in mind, this was a recorded conversation. He agreed to be recorded. He died seven months later of cancer. I always tell people, thank God I have him on tape because, yeah. you know, people would, they're so devil's advocates, they would say, how do we know he said that, Vince? How do you know we're not, you didn't make it up? You know, people are real vindictive sometimes with their, their cross-examination, everybody. And it's, to a point, it's good because we need rock-solid evidence. We can't have theories anymore. That, day, that day's over. But when he told me that, he said, I don't remember Kennedy ever saying anything about not having agents in the back of the car and then falling up with, if you look at the newsreel pictures, you'll see the agents on there from time to time. I couldn't believe it. But after I calmed down after like a couple of days or a couple of weeks, yeah, I was still excited about it. I was still revved up. But part of me said, you know what? you got to get corroboration because there's always going to be somebody out there saying, even though he sounded very lucid, very together, and he was, he could say, oh, maybe he's an old guy. Hey, how do we know that, you know, what's his colleagues have to say? So I said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to try to find everybody I can. This is before the internet, too, by the way. This is, I mean, there might have been those uh, bulletin boards. But for all intents and purposes, I didn't even know what the internet was. I was just all old, um, you know, public information, you know, calling directory assistance, old newspaper archives, trying to find where people live. So in, this is the point I want to make. Gerald Bain was totally corroborated like these guys were reading cue cards, and they weren't because they didn't even know I'd contacted this guy and this guy and this guy. Independent of each other, all over the country, they were all telling me that President Kennedy never ordered them off the limousine, never interfered with their actions, was a very nice man, was very cooperative. When I even broached the subject of what de death of a president was alleging, they would tell him, that's baloney. Oh, that's not true at all. Oh, he flunked as a historian. Don't read Manchester. Some of these guys are really nasty when it came to Manchester. Oh, that's, that's hogwash. Not true at all. And I kept on going over and over again. Well, they're saying this. There's no truth. Did he ever? Then I, I try to set myself up for a little bit of a fall. Did he sometimes order you guys off? No, never, never. He, he was very cooperative. Like Bob Lilly, who was with Kennedy from Election Day up to a month before the assassination transferred to the Boston office, told me, oh, no, he was very cooperative. He used to say, whatever you guys want is the way it will be. And he talked about a trip to Caracas, Venezuela, where he rode on the back of the car going 50 miles an hour. The bubble top was in the back of the car. Him and Roy Kellerman were hand, holding onto the handrails at 50 miles an hour. So that goes against that bunk. Clint Hill's trying to say all these excuses. And all the, hey, they were approaching the highway. There wouldn't have been agents on the back of the car anyway. Meantime, it, it's at my new book coming out later this year. There's an interview with him from 10 years ago, I guess before he thought he was going to come out with books. The former director of the Secret Service, Lou Merletti, is interviewing him. So I don't think he's lying to Lou. And he says, that, we should have been there, Lou. We should have been there. If we would have been on the back of the car at that time, we would have protected him. And maybe the assassination wouldn't have happened. So it's like, wait a minute. You're admitting it then. Now in your books all these years later, eight to ten years later, you're trying to turn it back on Kennedy. And ladies and gentlemen, the reason why they're blaming Kennedy again in their best-selling books is because of little old me, Woke a sleeping giant with Clint Hill in my 22-page letter in the summer of 2005. Scared the bejesus out of him because what Can happened Can you tell was, us the contents of that letter? Just a brief synopsis. Oh, sure. No problem at all. Here's what happened. Lynn Meredith was an agent. Good guy. He was one of the agents on the kitty, kitty detail that protected John Jr. and Caroline. Good guy. He was in the Secret Service for a number of years. Passed away about 70 years ago. But anyway, he... Uh, told me something amazing. First of all, he says, I can't tell you firsthand that the president ordered him off the car. I have no firsthand knowledge. But I'll tell you what, a good buddy of mine in the Secret Service named Clint Hill, I couldn't believe what he was about to tell me. He's like, oh boy, here it comes. I can, His address, he's unlisted. His phone number and his address. But if you want, I'll give them to you. I was like, uh, yeah, I'll take them. I couldn't believe I got Again, another one of these white as a sheet moments that he's given me his unlisted address and phone number. Only Mike Wallace of 60 Minutes spoke to him. It was an authorized interview. This is unbelievable. So uh, I should let me prep. He actually spoke to a couple of Secret Service documentaries, but they were authorized by the Secret Service. He said nothing new. But anyway, 
and I sent him a 22-page letter. And what that 22-page letter was, it was respectful to him, very respectful to him, in fact, but maybe too respectful, that's another story. But it, it, what it was was the Cliff Notes version of my book at the time. It was basically summarized all the chapters in a couple pages and had the hard evidence of what these gentlemen told me and all his colleagues. Well, when I... And I got a signed receipt that he got it. So there's no doubt he received it. He signed it, Clint Hill and all that and whatnot. I called him a couple of days later. I said, Mr. Hill, you received a letter. He goes, well, about what? Yeah, I received it. I have no interest in talking to you. And when I spoke to Gerald Blaine, I realized I was talking to Gerald Blaine. Oh, my God. Gerald Blaine lives in an entirely different state, states away. Gerald Blaine starts quoting from my private letter, Clint Hill. And then he's telling me he's been friends with Clint Hill since the late 50s when they served the Denver field office. He was just at Clint Hill's son's wedding. Oh, boy. And I'm thinking, oh, my God. These two guys are thick as thieves, best friends for decades. He shared my private letter, and he's telling me, yeah, don't be too hard on Emory Roberts. He was a double, even a triple checker. I'm thinking, oh, my Lord. These two guys are comparing notes. And I just were lead up to everything now these two guys were fly fishing in colorado were well retired they were approaching their 80th birthday they had no wherewithal to write books they wore it as a badge of courage where you never write a book never profit on this then all of a sudden i heard the trade papers kennedy detail by gerald blaine gerald blaine was a nobody he was only in the service for five years he was on the texas trip but he wasn't in dallas he was basically a nobody in the secret service he was a buck private of a long forgotten agent no acclaim and all, of all the people was this guy gerald blaine who i spoke to a couple of times who by the way adamantly told me kennedy never had anything to do with them being on the back of the car said very nice man never entered for their actions one of the many agents who corroborated gerald bain his boss and then when I got the book, I shook my head. I couldn't believe what I was reading. They were just white line. They were just flat, the white, the flat out line, throwing all the blame on Kennedy. And it was so overdone. People read the books. Vince, it's obvious he's referring to you. He says about the self-described Secret Service expert. If I named you on this one page, his other pages is, if anybody ever called us, we would give them the story. The President Kennedy never ordered us off the car because we did not want to blame the President. Like, wait a minute. Hold on a minute. Time out. These guys had, most of them had unlisted numbers. And by their own admission, I was virtually the only person to ever contact them. They were like, who are you? How did you get my name? How did you get my number? And now he's trying to claim there's a parade of people that contacted them and said these things. No, 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 no. What it boiled down to is that letter shook them up and they thought, what's going on? Is there going to be some sort of investigation? Is there going to be some sort of uh, hearings? They already knew about the hostile committee in the 70s. They thought this was all done. And before somebody out there might say, oh, Vince, come on, now you're a little, you're exaggerating, you're a little delusions of grandeur. No. In C-SPAN, uh, on May 2012, Clint Hill came on um, in Out of the Blue to Brian Lamb. He said he burned all his personal notes in 2005. I'm thinking, you burned all your notes, was that, what, after getting my letter? After being all mad? From 1963 to 2005, your notes were all fine, but you burned them all of all years, 2005. And then out of nowhere, Brian Lamb, this young fellow, Vince Palomare, we spoke to the last time. I know I'm getting ahead of myself. Yes, Gerald Blaine and Clint Hill uh, showed a YouTube video of me on C-SPAN and talked about me, denigrated me a little bit, but they talked all about me. Well, they said, hey, this young fellow we talked about last time, Vince Palomare, you remember him? Oh, yes. He came out in, about your book, Clint. He actually was uh, pretty praiseworthy and there's other than a couple pages, Clint Hill's books. Okay, it's by Jacqueline Kennedy. It's a pretty innocent book for the most part. But the point being is these guys on TV, two for two, took the time out to talk about little old me. If you look at the transcript, if you look at the whole program, they're talking about Jacqueline Kennedy, Kennedy, the Cuban Missile Crisis. Then out of nowhere, Vince Palomero, like, why? Why were they doing that? Hmm. They were doing that because they knew that, and they knew that I knew what the real story was. They had to lay out for the record, so to speak. We got to squash this guy. And they didn't know I was coming out of the book. They just thought, this is some young whippersnapper. These are on blogs. When I used to fly in the ointment on, on the internet, maybe we could squelch this right now. We'll just adamantly deny what he's saying and just go forward. And then three years later, my book came out and that's when really all hell broke loose. That's the JFK Assassination, the definitive book by Brent Holland. From inside the Oval Office to Davy Plaza, first-person witness accounts. Order yours right now. Nightfrightshow.com Bolden had told me that they would tell the public something, but when Bolden would speak to them privately, they would tell him the truth. 
that most of them, and I'm going to paraphrase, not exactly quote what he said, most of them said that the shots came from the front. As a matter of fact, I alluded to that in the beginning of the show. Paul Landis Paul was Landis, one of the agents, and he was in two of his reports said the shot came from the front, which also Dave Powers and Kenny O'Donnell, the two aides in the in the uh, fall part. That's right. Said the shots came from the front. Sam Kinney was funny. Sam Kinney in, in interviews with me, great guy. Spoke to him at length three times. He, he said that um, he was a he was weird. He goes, he thinks Oswald was a sole shooter, but he was adamant there was a conspiracy. Then he was adamant the back of the president's head was gone. And the thing about that is, official history is the back of the president's head's intact, only the side, and somehow, some way, mm -hmm. the shot came only from the rear, because entrance holes make small holes, and exit holes make large holes. But he was adamant to me, the oh, the back of the head, the right rear of the head, I don't know what else it could have been, because Sam Kinney found the piece of the back of the president's head on the C-130 cargo plane with the presidential limousine flying back to D.C. after it was all said and done. He said to me, and it's in my first book and in my second book, J.K. Parkland to Bethesda, he said, yeah, people have been wondering for 30-some for years, exactly, 30-some years uh, about this incredible missing part. Well, I've had the answer all these years, but no one's ever talked to me. And I was like, Sam, I'm talking to you. Tell me more. Tell me more. He said the only people that ever spoke to him, and he passed away in 1997, the only people that ever spoke to Sam, other than William Manchester, uh, and a couple of lines in his book, Pretty Innocent, Nothing Great, Great Shakes, the Today Show. And all the Today Show wanted to hear about was John Jr.'s salute. When Sam kept on telling them about this, they didn't, they didn't care. He said, no, 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 no. Tell us that story about John Jr. Do you teach him how to salute? And he was like, no, 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 no. I found the C-130. They weren't interested. They wanted a human interest, cute little story. So finally Sam went over, and when they aired the story, all they showed was Sam saying the shots rang out. Pow, pow, pow. So there's a little bit of space, and then it goes right to, yeah, whenever I see John Jr. saluting in that newsreel, it, it makes me want to cry. They had a golden opportunity. It's the only time Sam was ever on TV. The only official interview other than William Manchester. And again, what he said to William Manchester was no great shakes. And I spoke to the gentleman three different times between 1992 and 1994. Again, I have the stuff on, on tape, too. So between having things in writing and on audio tape, I just thank God I did that. I, I take my cue from uh, the late Harry Livingstone and also David Lifton. They were big. Because uh, they said they always did the same thing. you got to get it documented because someone's going to question you one day and say, how do we know they said that? How do we know you're not just making it up? Mm -hmm. so that's, I was always, that was always my guide. i got to get this for history and again i'm so glad i did because it's through attrition a lot of these gentlemen have passed away and uh, just through the years and you know there's a fair amount still alive but a, a lot have passed away and uh, sam being one of them like i said but the bottom line is they create what they did was and it caught everybody off the hook you know at first people were shocked and you know ruby kills oswald so a lot of people thought there was a conspiracy but they kind of wanted to put it put them put it behind them and then you know lbj's reelected. the warren commission comes out the Secret Service, right when people are starting to wonder, okay, what's going on? There's these news reports about these agents were drinking the night before. What squelched the whole thing is when the Warren Report came out and said that President Kennedy didn't want them on the back of the car. As soon as people read that, they were like, next. That's why early on, no one ever cast aspersions on the Secret Service. No one ever looked at them. In fact, if anything, the opposite was true. Oh, Clint, he, Clint Hill's such a hero. Rufus Youngblood's such a hero. Oh, God bless these men. Oh, they tried. Oh, it's a shame. This brilliant coup. What do I, I make the, the analogy. Jessica Lynch of the Iraq War was a false hero by her own admission. They tried to make her out to be like Rambo. And then went, no, I wasn't. It was all exaggerated for PR purposes, just like the late Pat Tillman, bless his soul. I mean, he was shot by friendly fire. They tried to make him out a hero. And what they did with Clint Hill was, Clint Hill was one of the agents drinking the night before. Should have been kicked out of the service. And that's not me being nasty. That's, that's the God's honest truth. That's in the Secret Service manual. Yep. One of the pages was reproduced in the Warren Commission volumes, volume 18. It even says, drinking while travel staff is grounds for removal from the mm -hmm. service. Chief Riley, under oath to the Chief Justice of all people, this is the Chief Justice Warren's best moments were in the entire Warren Commission. He's drilling Chief Riley. He says, you know, if a man didn't stay up late and wasn't drinking the night before, do you think he would have noticed a rifle in a, in a building and maybe done something about it? And that's when he was like, well, I thought about punishment for these men, but I didn't want to stigmatize them to their families. I just didn't, you know, I just didn't want to stigmatize these poor gentlemen. Like, you didn't want to stigmatize. You imagine this happened now. Now, that Cartagena, Columbia incident from 2012 under Obama. Yep. Obama was not even in country, and, and guys were being fired. It would made worldwide news. It was an embarrassment, a blight on the agency. They're still feeling to the, today with the new director, Joe Clancy, still trying to clean house. And yet they lost a president 
these nine agents, one of them was Clint Hill and three other agents in the fog car, one of them being Jack Reddy, the aforementioned uh, Glenn Bennett, and um, who's the other one? Paul Landis. Paul Landis stayed out till 5 a.m. They didn't report for duty 8 a.m. Paul Landis stayed out till 5 a.m. Clint Hill stayed out till almost 3 a.m. Now, assuming they went right back to bed, um, being very facetious, they sarcastic, went back to bed. Sure, they did. Sleep deprivation. Imagine you have to, your reflexes, you live and die in your reflexes, and how much alcohol did you really drink that you admitted to? So these guys said, I only had three beers. I only had a scotch and soda. That's what they, a limited hangout, so they're admitting. Well, let's even give them the benefit of the doubt on that. All they had was a couple of cans of beer and that. Uh, tried to protect the president on like two to three hours of sleep, assuming they even slept. I said, that's why the reason the next day they had dark sunglasses on. It was a hangover. You know, that's, in Paul Landis, it, it's very telling. He's trying to be cute in his Secret Service report, but I wonder if it was a little more truth to this. He said he went up to Sam Kennedy at Love Field and said, which car's the fallout car? And I'm thinking, was he being cute or was he hung over? Like, which car's the fallout car, man? He didn't know which one. You know, he could leave up to interpretation. But the bottom line is they made Clint Hill, Clint Hill out to be a hero. He was a false hero. When the shooting began, he's still on the fallout car. Alkin's photo, JFK's reacting to the throat shot, which I think came to the front, or you could just say the back shot, whatever people want to believe. Clint Hill is rigid on the fall car. When the headshot happens and Kennedy goes back into the left and then falls into Jacqueline's lap, Jacqueline gets out of the, onto the trunk of the car. Only then do you see Clint Hill on the back of the car. They never actually touch. Clint, uh, Jackie Kennedy gets in and out of the car of her own volition. She goes to reach morbidly for a piece of the back of the president's head that got into the trunk and goes back into the car. But they never actually touch. Now, I think that Clint Hill was more like for the, the, the bravery, the attempt, the heroism. But like something, you know, I told people like... Uh, Art Godfrey was an agent on Kennedy's detail, one of the good guys. He had, um, I think, he got a Bronze Star and a couple other um, accommodations for World War II for actual bravery in the line of fire. He actually saved an agent. He, it was like, he was like, say, the real saving Private Ryan. He saved the guy from behind enemy lines. They don't give medals for attempts. And this guy, he was pro he was propped up. It was brilliant PR for the Secret Service. They were so scared of losing mm. the agency, their pensions, maybe going to before Congress, maybe even worse, maybe even some criminality to all this. So what they did was they put the blame on Kennedy to get everybody looking the other way and take the blame off them. Then they trotted out Clint Hill as the hero. Oh, he tried to do so. That's why Clint Hill never accepted the medal. That's why he was crying his eyes out in 1975 to Mike Waz. I don't care about that, Mike. I don't care about that award. If I would have reacted just a little bit quicker, and I'll leave that to my grave. And like I said, up to and including 2005, he's telling people that we should have been there. We should have been in the back of the car, although he's still tacitly blaming Kennedy for it. It was only after my letter... And after everything happened, everything got turned around. They said, well, we wouldn't have been on the back of a car at that point anyway. We were about to enter the freeway, and hey, we didn't want to have been anybody there. It was a sparse crowd. It's just all a bunch of bunk. What it was is they realized they were they were caught, hung out to dry. <laughs> you know, I basically, uh, when I interviewed these guys, they said, you you contacted by Vince Palomero, too. And they, they compared notes. They realized what was going on. They said, this guy, like Gerald Blaine on C-SPAN said, Vince Palomero probably contacted every one of my colleagues. I said, yeah, I did. And they said the same thing to me, Gerald, and so did you back in 2004, 2005. In fact, what's really amazing is he makes, he goes page after page after page, Gerald Blaine does the Kennedy detail and says that, President Kennedy supposedly said, get these Ivy League charlatans off the back of my car. Kennedy is never on record ever using that kind of language. He's mm -hmm. from an Ivy League school, Harvard. Yeah, would you would never denigrate your own school and denigrate the men on the back of the car. If they're from Ivy League, if he's Ivy League, you wouldn't use that verbiage. But more importantly, Floyd Boring, who was the number two agent of the Secret Service who rode in that car, said there's no truth to that. William Manchester made that up. He never spoke to William Manchester. He doesn't know what that's about. Sure. President Kennedy never interfered with their actions at all. And Gerald Blaine, when I spoke to him back in 2005, before he was ever thinking about a book, he said, I don't know where that came from. That came from the guys. I don't remember who said it. I don't remember. His memory got real much, a lot better five years later. He says, I heard it loud and clearer in my walkie-talkie from Floyd Bourne, who died two years before. So Floyd Isn't Bourne. that convenient? You know, so it's all, it's all convenient. People passed away, so it was safe to put throw them under the bus because they're not there to say, Gerald, that's not true, that's not true. There was one agent I did speak to, though, Talmadge Bale, who said that meeting of Gerald Blaine talking about is horse shit. That's an exact <laughs> quote. Pardon my French. That's no, exact, that's fine. That'll work. So it's, it's a, a it's exact right, quote. We go anywhere. Yeah. And, uh, it, it, and the thing is, he goes page to page of this 
made up dialogue. And General Blaine has a brilliant mind. He can remember exactly word for word, provide notes, transcripts, and recordings what these gentlemen said 50 years later. And yet, to a man, they all told me different things. Winston Lawson told me he doesn't remember ever Kennedy ever ordered them off the car. And he was a lead advance agent. He says, it never came to my attention as such. I got a letter from him saying this. And yet, in General Blaine's book, he's saying Winston Lawson was at this meeting. And yeah, the, all the lead agents knew about not having agents on the back of the car. I was like, wait a minute, Gerald. He told me something else. I got it in writing, pal. And that's when my book came out. And that's when so really, they, they, again, they didn't expect the book to come out. They didn't expect, they thought that their book was going to squelch me and that was the end of it. So the I can't look at the book. In, in, We've only got a few minutes left and I want to get through a couple of things. One of the things sure. I wanted to mention, and I agree with you completely, it would have been so easy to mention putting snipers on the roof to watch. And in Dealey Plaza, folks, there's a police station. <laughs> yes. What would it have taken for somebody to go up and sit on the roof of that very police station to cover the whole area? You don't have to put a sniper on every roof. Exactly. You write so Brett why so didn't good. that happen? Yeah, why Roger Craig, happen? one of the sheriffs, he's famously, a lot of people know this, Roger Craig said, we were told to in no way participate in the security of that motorcade. We are be there to be spectators and nothing more. So when they passed that part of Main Street, they were all standing there doing nothing. Sheriff Decker told them not to, not to be involved, and yet Arnold Rowland, um, one of the witnesses, his wife Barbara, looked up and said, hey, look, there's a Secret Service man in that window before the motorcade even got there. So it was either Oswald or it was a, one of the actual assassins. But again, imagine if a Secret Service agent or a guard with a rifle would have been there and looking up and would have saw that that wasn't an authorized gentleman. Abort, abort. There's there's a man with a rifle in that window. And so that's that's the tragedy of all that this. And there's so much more to it than that. But, yeah. I want to read this from Vince's book because this is terrific. This is uh, The book is called JFK from Parkland to Bethesda, The Ultimate Kennedy Assassination Compendium. Vince Palomara has been our guest tonight. www.nightfrightshow.com. Click on tonight's guests book covers <laughs> in stereo i'm gonna to have to grow a hand for your next one you know that yeah I know. <laughs> triple w dot night fright show order it you're gonna love it it's they're fantastic this is from jackie kennedy's actual testimony um she goes on to say all the ride to the hospital i kept bending over him saying jack jack can you hear me i love you jack i kept holding the top of his head down, trying to keep the the long ride to the hospital. These big Texas interns kept saying, Mrs. Kennedy, come with us. They wanted to take me away from him. Dave Powers came running to me. My legs, my hands were covered with brains. When Dave Powers saw this, he burst out weeping. Yes. And the idea being she was trying to hold his head together because it had completely exploded. And this is her real testimony in Vince's new book, JFK from Parkland to Bethesda. You're going to want to get this for your library. If you're serious at all about the Kennedy assassination and doing research, it's all in here. All the actual testimony from the Secret Service agents through to the doctors at Bethesda, through to Jackie Kennedy. I mean, it's really, really essential for any serious researcher or a novice, in fact, that is just starting their research www.nightfrightshow.com order the book you won't be sorry and definitely get survivor's guilt without a question um there's fans of this show will know vince has been on twice now and when it comes to the secret service there is no one on the planet i believe that is better than vince yeah. palomar appreciate it brent thanks you're very very welcome so you've got a new book coming i'm very anxious to see this because what i would like to do um, when it's out, I'd like to have you back on and we could go through the various um, decades, if you will, and see how the Secret Service has changed where when the Kennedy assassination happened, they were derelict and what lessons were learned from that and carried forward that may have saved President Reagan. Who knows? Yes. You know, that's a possibility, too. But this cover up, you know, it really bothers me. I'd like to spend uh, the last few moments. We've only got three minutes left talking oh, about oh, Abraham Bolden. Oh, great. Could you tell us your own personal feelings with it, with Mr. Bolden? I know you spoke to him as well and you hold oh. him very high esteem as I do as an American hero. Oh, Abraham Bolden is amazing. I devoted a chapter in my book, Survivor's Guilt, and he's also in several other pages here and there in the book. 
And Abraham Bolden, um, he served from 1960 to 1964. So, you know, Eisenhower, JFK, and LBJ. He protected LBJ and Kennedy, actually, on several different trips. And he had um, received several uh, accommodations for um, counterfeiting. He was known as a really good street agent. Bob Lilly told me, oh, he was a really good street agent. He got a lot of acclaim and whatnot, but what it was was Abraham Bolden was not one of those guys to keep their mouth shut. He was an African-American, first African-American on the White House detail. Yeah. He saw the dereliction of duty. He saw them drinking uh, on duty. He saw the, the uh, pardon the phrase, the sex parties, the things they were doing you know, on, on duty. And he complained about this in 1961. And he had, he had a very racist supervisor at the time, Harvey Henderson. That's I get right. into that in my new book. But, um, Called yeah. him the N-word and so, everything. Yeah, and he uh, they put him back in the Chicago offices. You're not fit for the White House detail. This 30-day trial period's up. And, he, and Jack, you know, JFK picked him. He saw him in Chicago. He said, how would you like to break down walls? How would you like to be a pioneer and be like the Jackie Robinson and the Secret Service come to the White House detail? And, you know... Abe did his duty, and there's actually, thank God, there's at least one photograph of him with, um, I think it's the British Prime Minister's daughters. He's guarding in JFK's there, and Abraham's there. But good man, and uh, he was railroaded for something he did not do, for something that maybe would have got a slap on the wrist. He was put in federal prison for 30 roughly, seconds, Vince. For something he did not do. The, the guy who sent him down the river admitted he perjured himself That's right. via the district attorney. The district attorney. When he was put under oath, said he, he asserted his Fifth Amendment privilege. Why? Because you're afraid of getting in big trouble for uh, suborning perjury. Abraham Bolden did not do what they claimed he did. And the reason why they did it to Abe is because they want to taint him, because Abe would bring down the whole Damn, house there's apart. the music. I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. It is always a pleasure to see you, my friend. Awesome. Thank you so much. I'm Brent Holland from Night Fright. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. Inside the Oval Office to Davy Plaza. First person witness accounts. Order yours right now. Nightfrightshow.com. <laughs> <laughs>